For as long as there have been Star Trek stories, there have been fan theories about every little element of them. With close to 60 years of stories to draw on, it seems bizarre not to draw on the wealth of fan theorising out there. Plus, the more chance we get to talk about the shoulda, woulda, couldas of Star Trek, well, that gets us all on board. This is Trek Culture and I am Dan Blaze. We're going to look today at 10 Star Trek fan theories that became fact. At number 10, Garrick really did love Bashir. In Garrick's very first appearance in Deep Space Nine, the tailor seems to have a more than passing interest in Dr. Bashir. While subsequent episodes would drop this particular story thread, questions of the man's sexual orientation followed him through to the end of the series and beyond. Shippers worldwide have dreamed of Garrick and Bashir becoming an item, with several recent revelations throwing fuel on this flame. Firstly, Andrew Robinson himself has stated unequivocally that he played Garrick as sexually interested in Bashir in that first appearance. There was no confusion on his part that Garak definitely wanted to, uh, <clears throat> well, you know. During the lockdown, Alexander Siddig and Andrew Robinson participated in an online reading of Garak and Bashir's reunion 20 years later. This meeting covered topics such as the death of Esri Dax and Bashir's subsequent relationship with a male host. They would go on to finally address the unspoken love that they felt for each other. It was a moment that fans had long thought coming and at last was addressed by the two actors themselves. At number 9, the future guy was Archer. The figure from the future who offers advice, at least in some elements, to Captain Archer was never revealed on screen. The events of Stormfront wrap up the temporal Cold War in Enterprise as the producers felt that the storyline had run its course, even with various plots still dangling. One such plot was the identity of the future figure. Many theories exist as to his identity, yet Brandon Bragger, who was of course co-executive producer with Rick Berman, believes him to be Archer in the the future and had intended on writing it to be so. The vision of Archer was guiding his younger self so as to avoid a catastrophe in the past. It would have made for a full circle twist as the figure appeared in the very first episode, Broken Bow. With the inclusion of the temporal accords in Star Trek Discovery, the seeds of a return for the future figure have already been sown. There are more and more cries for Archer to return, with time travel being one of the easiest ways to write him into the show. Tying the temporal Cold War into Discovery's fourth season may yet reveal that Archer has been pulling more strings than anyone ever imagined. At number 8, Kaelas Never Returned Kaelas the Unforgettable returns to the Klingon Empire in the 24th century, appearing before Worf on the moon of Borath. Though initially Worf is overjoyed, his feelings turn sour when he discovers that the man is in fact a clone of the Great Warrior, taken from a sample on the legendary Knife of Kirom. However, a fan theory speculated that this clone was another deception altogether. The monks on Borath had not cloned Kaelas at all, but his brother Morath. The novel shows that Kaelas was not the man that the legends painted him to be. He was still a warrior, but not the mythical being that the Klingons now worship him as. He did fight to defeat Molor, the tyrant of old, with his wife, the Lady Lucara, yet he was saved from death when his brother took a stab wound from the knife that was meant for him. The revelation of the ancient testament of Kaelas undoes much of the mystery around the man, deepening Klingon lore and expanding him from a one-dimensional demigod. At number 7, the Ancient Ones were teased in the original series. Ronald D. Moore, the writer of the Next Generation episode The Chase, has stated that he considered, though purposefully did not write it into the script, that the ancient humanoids that Starfleet, the Klingons, the Romulans and the Cardassians learn of were in fact the same race of aliens from the original series episode the Paradise Syndrome. In that earlier story, the Preservers were a race who travelled the galaxy, rescuing groups who were facing extinction and brought them to other worlds to help them flourish. To keep them safe, large obelisks were constructed on the planets that acted as deflector shields, aiming asteroids away. One such obelisk was present on the planet Amarind, while another was located on one of the moons of Andor. Though the Preservers were long gone by the time the planet was discovered by the Enterprise, they were in fact 
fact, the same progenitors that seeded the galaxy with their DNA millions of years before. The common ancestral DNA was shared by many of the galaxy's most prominent species, suggesting that at least some of their advancements were thanks to the genetic memory inherited from this race. Number 6. The Ferengi were cunning from the start the Ferengi of the Next Generation's first season were awful. There, we've said it. They were touted as being the next big villain of Star Trek before it turned out that they were about as intimidating as an old sock. So a serious amount of story shifting and retconning had to be quickly written into effect. Going forward, the Ferengi would become more relaxed, yet an intriguing species thanks almost entirely to Armin Shimmerman. However, a fan theory posted that the initial goofy appearance of the Ferengi was a ruse. This would be a good way of getting a measure of Starfleet without attacking them head on. It made their military seem meaner and their people seemed dumber, all in their own version of exploration. The novel The Buried Age goes a distance to redeeming the early Ferengi. They were putting on an act, albeit a very strange one, as a way to see how the Federation would react to encountering them. While it may not have made the most sense overall, it is good to see that it wasn't something silly, like just a wildly poor choice when it came to their initial depiction. Number 5. Geordie was punished with ocular implants In The Next Generation's second season, Dr. Pulaski remarks to Geordie that he could be fitted with ocular implants to replace his visor. This line was included at the request of LeVar Burton, who was already growing very tired of having to wear the prop. His wish would only become a reality years later during Star Trek First Contact. However, the reason behind this was actually a punishment of sorts. Fans were quick to point out after Star Trek Generations debuted that his visor was a security risk to the ship. Having been kidnapped by the Duras sisters, a transmitter was implanted in the device, which allowed them to destroy the Enterprise D, although the crew survived. Admiral Hayes, who appeared in the first film, issues LaForge with an ultimatum. The chief engineer could not be allowed to access such sensitive locations while bearing the device that could be hacked in such a Away. He had the choice of ocular implants or a transfer to a less secure posting. Thankfully, this order was really everything he had wanted, so LaForge quickly agreed to the transplant. At number 4, and definitely my favourite, Trelane is a Q child. The novel Q Squared confirmed what many fans believed from the moment Encounter at Farpoint hit screens in 1987 that John Delancey's Q was not the first member of that race to have been encountered by either Starfleet or the audience. The first one that we knew of was Trelane in the original series episode The Squire of Gothos. He was revealed in the novel to have been an adolescent Q who was still very much coming to terms with his powers. He was set about exploring other races and beings in the galaxy though required an artifact to focus his powers. In the episode, the artifact was a mirror on his wall. This might suggest that he was a mere infant, as by the time the crew of Voyager encountered Keegan Delancey's Q child, he was quite adept at using his powers at only three Earth years of age. William Campbell's Trelane is one of the most fun guest stars of early Trek. He's both menacing and playful and disciplined by his parents and brought home even when he wants to play. He even served as inspiration in the performance that Delancey Sr. has brought to his now infamous character. Number 3. Life is but a dream Benny Russell was a fascinating creation. He was both the dreamer and the dream, created by the Prophets as an attempt to help Cisco course correct and stay where he was on Deep Space Nine. However, the ending of Far Beyond the Stars suggests that Benny goes even deeper than that. Staring out of one of the station's windows, Cisco wonders if he, in fact, is the dream and Russell is the reality. According to Ira Stephen Bear, that was the original ending of Deep Space Nine. Everything would come to a close Cisco would go to live with the Prophets and it would all be revealed as a dream that Benny was having this whole time. The sole reason that this was not included in the final episode was that the rest of the producers of the franchise were uncomfortable with the implications of this. Deep Space Nine was so deeply interwoven with the rest of the series that for it to have all been a dream, so too would the original series, the animated series, The Next Generation and Voyager. It would have also retroactively included Enterprise and all the series. CBS shows as well. While this would have been a next to perfect ending for Cisco, it remains one of those true but secret moments. Number 2. Tom just changed his name to Nick 
Robert Duncan McNeil is most famous in Star Trek for playing Thomas Eugene Paris in Star Trek Voyager. However, it was not his first appearance as he also played cadet Nick Lacano in The Next Generation, a young man who is expelled from the Academy after he attempts to cover up the death of another classmate. Once it was announced that McNeil would be playing a brash young officer who had troubles with the law for Voyager, fans quickly assumed that they would be seeing Lacano step onto the bridge of the new ship. However, the character of Lacano would have required paying royalties to the writer of the first duty for every single episode that featured featured him, even though that writer has since disputed this theory. Therefore, Locarno was given a quick and thin rewrite, named Paris, and then they were good to go. Ronald D. Moore was opposed to the idea of changing the name. The reason given was that Locarno's actions during his Academy years made him irredeemable to an audience, though Moore felt that Paris had committed enough crimes to run the risk of this as well. The prevailing theory suggests that he was Tom Paris all along, who had been accepted into the Academy with the help of his father, Admiral Owen Paris. He quickly changed his name to Nick Lucano to avoid the appearance of favouritism, which ended up being a bit of a blessing when the name he chose became a toxic one. Having been expelled from the Academy, he drifted through life before meeting with the Marquis under his birth name again. The rest is Starfleet history. And at number one, genetic mutations gave us smooth Klingons. One of the oldest theories out there to be explained in the Star Trek universe is why the Klingons looked so different between the original series and the motion picture. While behind the scenes there was a simple case of making them look meaner for the big screen, something that their ships went through as well on screen, there was little explanation as to why there was such a change. The difference was pointed out in the fan favourite Deep Space Nine episode Trials and Tribulations, where Worf states clearly that Klingons do not speak of it with off-worlders and it wouldn't be until Enterprise's fourth season that the fan theory on the matter would be confirmed. While fan theories blamed a genetic mutation on the change of appearance, it was very close to the fact. Experiments with augmented DNA spread rapidly throughout the Empire, flattening the foreheads of every warrior for at least a couple of generations. While the new, smoother Klingons were far less intimidating, they were still Klingons at heart. They simply had to rely more on their cunning and prowess in battle to inspire fear rather than baring their teeth.